I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. I initially found out about this week's guest Simon Marungi via LinkedIn which if you're not already on is actually a really good place to connect with interesting people from the field of horticulture and actually beyond that. It is a little bit off topic but I think it's an important issue to talk about and if you're listening to Roots and All you probably are interested in organic gardening and as an extension of that organic farming. So Simon is an organic farming trainer who founded the organisation South Africa, which stands for Spreading Organic Farming in Africa. He's passionate about agro-ecological regenerative agriculture and rural development and sees organic farming methods as a sustainable approach that can turn around smallholder agriculture from mere subsistence farming to a more commercial enterprise. I started by asking Simon how he became involved in the drive to promote organic farming. Basically, uh, before I got in, uh, involved in organic farming, I used to be a student and uh, I was studying uh, organic agriculture as a diploma and later on a bachelor's in the same. And from there, actually, I had passion, a great passion uh, when it comes to uh, organic farming. That's why I proceeded to, to study the same. Then later on, uh, my main agenda was also I had passion to transform the the society because of the difficulties and challenges I saw them uh, undergoing, especially uh, during the times when there is famine, uh, food problems. Actually, a lot of food insecurity was also a very major uh, challenge that I tried to I was trying to address. From there. Uh, after my studies, actually, I started or founded an organization called Sofa Africa, that is in issues for spreading organic farming in Africa. And basically, the organization is uh, concerned with training farmers and schools on climate issues and mitigation strategies. Also training them on nutrition, better ways of uh, eat, uh, eating uh, healthy food. Also, you find that uh, in the same uh, organization, we train uh, residents or the communities on uh, soil conservation, conservation of wildlife, conservation of our soils, even uh, protection of our rivers from pollution. So basically, uh, that is the main concern that I got myself involved with the organization so far Africa and so far I've managed to partner with uh, various organizations especially the UNEP that is the United Nations Environmental Prog- Prog- uh, Program which is a UN body on issues regarding now uh, conservation and even uh, issues concerning uh, reduction of pollution and basically, on the other hand, I partnered with a, a movement that is called the Extinction Rebellion International that is in the UK. And we are really trying to uh, come forth and create awareness on climate change issues. Also, volunteering with the Fridays for Future is also a concern uh, regarding uh, climate change awareness and other effects that are being uh, experienced as a result of climate change. So basically, uh, also the government, actually we are trying to lobby with the government and try to put them on board so that we can be able to uh, initiate several programs around schools. And when I mean schools, also we have been teaming up with youth, youth groups. Uh, this youth group, basically we are meeting them in schools So far, we've uh, managed to work with over 300 youth in colleges, in universities, and even in uh, other tertiary uh, institutions of learning. And through this, actually, uh, the youth are are getting a chance also to air their voice 
and to raise their concerns on various challenges they are meeting. Besides the challenge of environment, also they have other social and even economical challenges they are meeting. So out of all this, now we have been able to have a forum, actually an open forum, that uh, they have been given a chance to, to actually air their challenges all through. I think that is how basically I have been doing over here in Kenya. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned economic challenges. So actually organic farming, is that more mm-hmm. costly than farming that is non-organic? Does it involve more expense for, for farmers? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, basically, organic farming is very, very much uh, affordable to even the common uh, farmers because now uh, instead of them buying the synthetic fertilizers from the agrovet shop, now they are able to make their own compost. We train them out to make their own compost, make their own uh, booster fertilizers, foliar fertilizers, using even the indigenous uh, plants that we are having. Uh, for example, we have this plant that we usually use that is called Tidonia. Tidonia is very, very much rich in nitrogen. And once we soak it for four days with water, you are able now to uh, get very conch uh, water uh, mixture that is very rich in nitrogen that you can use to spray on the crop, maybe vegetable, the leaves. That is now the foliar fertilizer I'm mentioning. And that one is very effective even to be able to also kill the pest. If you have medicinal uh, pests for uh, uh, quantities, and also it has the factor of fertilizing the crop. So it becomes very, very affordable for a common farmer, and the money that that farmer was to use for buying those fertilizers, the farmer now is able to invest in other sectors in the society, in the farm, and even able to save more money to even build uh, housing and even to support uh, the children in school. So I support organic farming because it's very, very much affordable. And how do you you find that it affects the yield of crops? Are farmers tending to produce more? Well, uh, in the initial stages when it, it comes to a farmer converting, that conversion period, converting from a synthetic way of uh, farming to organic farming, actually it takes time. Uh, the conversion period can take a period of like 24 months. That's around two years. For the farmer, for the soil, starting with the soil, for the soil to be able to uh, adopt uh, to the new uh, sort of organic uh, input for the fertilizers. So after two years now, the production For the farmers that we started with two years ago, we have realized an increment, an increment in production. Also, soil fertility is becoming uh, much better than when they used to use now the synthetic fertilizers. When people convert to organic farming, what is it that they are doing to improve their soils? Uh, At the moment, uh, what they are doing, actually, because we train them also on soil conservation, uh, soils are also very eroded, especially when you are using the sedentary fertilizers because they kill a lot of the worms, like the other worms that are in the soil. So you find uh, once the soil lacks these uh, other worms, the soil becomes dead. And even it's not aerated, it has no air circulation in it, so it becomes interlocked in such a way that uh, the crop to survive in such a a dead uh, soil is very difficult. So the yields become low and you find farming becoming not profitable. And what the, the, the farmers are now doing is now increasing more of compost in their soil. And this compost also is entertaining beneficial uh, Adworms that also create, help to break down the, the compost and also aerate the soil. So this is one step that they are taking to improve their soil. And also now uh, other farming techniques. We have several farming techniques that they are able to, to, we are training them so that they can be able to, to uh, 
uh, have water retention in their soil, unlike the water being carried away when it is irrigated, the soil is irrigated, or when it, uh, we're having heavy rain. So they are farming techniques that sustain them for conserving the water deep down in the soil. Yeah. Hmm. And presumably that means there is less water input needed when they're doing the organic farming. Uh, perfect. Exactly when we are using uh, the organic method of farming, you find there is less water usage because the, the soil becomes uh, very, very uh, heavy in such a way that it's able to hold water in the soil, unlike when you are using now the fertilizers, because the synthetic fertilizers are just particles. They are particles like salt or they are particles like sugar. So you find they get they are associated very fast and they are unable even to, to bring the soil together. But when you use compost, you find now it, the, the compaction becomes even much better, much even heavier. So it holds a lot of water and reduces on water losses and even evaporation itself. So as a yeah. percentage, could you estimate how many farmers in Kenya are, are for farming organically? Well, uh, Kenya is divided into 47 counties. And as for the last data for the last one year or so, we've been having every county with uh, approximately uh, 500 farmers who are actively uh, confirmed and practicing uh, active organic farming. So it's 500 multiplied by 47. That can give us uh, quite a big approximate approximate figure of the farmers that we are having who are actively involved, although others are still adopting with time because we have had the success stories of organic farming. So we are expecting by the end of the year there will be quite a big impact of increment and you'll find that many more farmers are going to adopt because also they have heard of the awareness that we try to create on the health benefits. Because we are having uh, lifestyle diseases that are being caused by farming inorganically. You find like some cancerous effects, some blood sugar, some heart diseases are coming out of uh, the consumption of these crops that are planted using the chemicals, the, the pesticides that are uh, chemically based. So you find out of that now they have been able to hear the awareness and they are trying to adopt each and every uh, moment when they are practicing farming. So we expect at the end of the year to have quite a bigger incre increased number of farmers in Kenya who will be actively being involved in organic farming. And also the export market uh, actually is picking, is gaining momentum of uh, products that are organically produced. So you find also farmers are, are very much interested to transform from inorganic farming to organic farming, even for coffee and tea, so that they can pick a better price in the export market. Mm. So uh, actually that brings up an interesting point, which is the fair trade initiatives. And how do they work alongside um, sustainable farming practices? Because obviously they're trying to get a better wage for communities, but does that mean there's an impact on the yield and the profits that encourages some farmers to maybe cut corners? Perfect. In fact, uh, the way the organic market is, uh, is picking or uh, is coming up, actually, you find that they have a bigger cutting edge. The profit margin on organic products is encouraging uh, many farmers to venture into the practice. So with time, they'll, we shall be having many who will venture and be interested in venturing in organic farming for health and even increasing their wealth or their profit uh, benefits. Mm, brilliant. That's really good. Um, so if people or if farmers objected to organic methods, what might be some of the more common objections to it and how do you overcome these? Well, uh, that's a good question because 
uh, in this uh, line of uh, creating our awareness on organic farming, we've been experiencing challenges because one, there is a lot of competition from uh, these inventive uh, producers of uh, mostly the pest, uh, pesticide, the glass, glyphosate, and even all inorganic uh, products in the market. So competition also is very, very high. That is one factor that we are facing from the synthetic uh, uh, companies, which are uh, international and others are local based. And now you find also on the organic, on our side now, to be able to counter competition, we need a lot of maybe media involvement in create creation of awareness. And once it comes to that, also funding also comes in hand because for you to be able to, to uh, maybe play some advertisements, some billboards to uh, showcase how organic farming is important, also to move in this uh, from one county to another county, trying to uh, have several seminars, workshops, that uh, cost comes in. So uh, competition is a, a factor. Then funding actually is also a factor to be able to increase or create more awareness, of which also we've been trying to uh, write different uh, organizations abroad, and even local organizations uh, funding the donors and some uh, all that so that we can increase the, maybe the, the financial base so that we can be able to venture into various different uh, parts of the country to get the awareness. Then the third one, uh, the other challenge is climate, actually. Climate change, because uh, some areas you find that after the training, yes, you train the farmers, then they, have, uh, they start their, their farming, they, have, uh, they are planting, and after a certain period of time, uh, then they become less. So you find now their crops dry out a lot of it very high if it dries the crop. So you find that's also another challenge. Climate, funding, and competition. Those are the, the few challenges actually that we have been facing. Also, the last challenge actually is also comes in when it is patience. Patience with the farmers because the conversion period from synthetic farming to organic, uh, to become a fully fledged organic farmer, you have to be patient for almost two years so that you can start now realizing the higher profit, the production becomes higher. So those are the main challenges that I can say we are facing around. So the last uh, but not least is the now importation. We have imports of other uh, yeah, yeah. GMOs. GMOs are another genetically modified uh, food, crops, and seeds from also other international countries, which also is a challenge, which also can be regulated by trying to lobby with the government. So approach to the government also is very important so that the policies actually are trying to see how they can change to some policies and try to reduce on the importation of the GMOs. How easy is it for farmers to buy organic seed? I can say it is becoming a very, very uh, interesting, actually, market at the moment because of the health benefits, actually, the farmers, even the buyers, the consumers, the message that we have tried to transfer to different uh, stakeholders also. And the health benefits actually have made uh, the farmers or even other consumers to be uh, very much interested in buying the organic food. And again, they are affordable because uh, the, the farmers are selling them in a, an affordable uh, price because they have not uh, used a lot of money buying those synthetic fertilizers, those synthetic uh, pesticides, because we have trained them how to make the, the pesticides, the organic uh, biopesticides, and also the organic synthetic uh, organic fertilizers. So they have reduced the cost on uh, input. 
So they are able now to sell uh, the organic products cheaply. So the buyers are now very much interested to buy the organic food. I guess that's important as well because it means you have control over your own seed supply within the country or within local areas. I can say the trend actually that we are we are anticipating is that uh, these farmers can become self uh, sufficient and also they can help facilitate uh, the supply of food within uh, the country. So with that Actually, this will uh, reduce on importation of feed because once the farmers, what has made many farmers to rely on imported feed is just that there is a lot of cost involved when doing the farming because of buying a lot of uh, farm input. But now when we go organic, it becomes affordable, it becomes self-sufficient, so there will be no need to source even food from abroad. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yes, brilliant. Um, so what are your plans for the future or where do you hope this will go? Uh, the focus ahead actually is under what you just trying to align with sustainable development goals from the UN. Actually, I can say our vision is goes up to a vision of like Vision 2030. Uh, but, but 10 years from now, one thing we would like to have managed to have done around even 10 million tree planting when it comes to environment conservation. That means a year, a million trees. That's what we have proposed in our uh, agenda. Then another thing when it comes to nutrition, we would like to have a very much improved uh, health sectors, nutrition-wise, people feeding much more of organic food, and like these are symmetrically uh, planted seeds. That comes in our 10-year uh, plan. Then another thing, uh, economically, in fact, we want to have most farmers empowered, sales empowered, in such a way that they are able to produce their uh, uh, crop, they are able to market them because we shall be assisting them to access the market so that they can empower themselves because of their, the trophies they have gotten so that they can be able to invest in other different uh, areas, areas of health, areas of education, and also areas of infrastructure so that they can have uh, their basic needs met, housing and all that. Another vision is on uh, self-employment. In fact, we want to create more jobs, unlike the youth that we are having, relying on having uh, employment uh, given or provided by the government. They can be able also to have their own job created. They employ also their own fellow youth. So you see that will empower the youth and also this will make also the youth, because the youth are important because they are the, the future of every economy in every country. So they'll be empowered. And from there, those are exactly the 10-year actually plan that we want to be having. Brilliant. It sounds amazing. Um, and I think you're doing excellent work. So is there anything that international consumers can do to support the initiative or is there anything any way that people can get in touch or help out exactly that is very important when it comes to international market or uh, international individuals because also we would like uh, them to get us to source actually outsource market because you see we at times we experience surplus production over here especially when it comes to uh, various uh, sort of crop or, pro or produce. So market, market for our product, so market for our goods, export market, actually, that is very, very important. Also linking us with like-minded internationalist movements or bodies that actually are very much involved with organic farming, 
and even institutions like universities, uh, colleges, technical institutes of research that are also dealing with the same. So linkages also, they are very important for in information sharing and also for uh, mainly research, actually. So another thing for the international market also is linking us with the potential maybe donors, potential partners, so that we can be able to make uh, organic farming uh, have a big impact, not only in locally, but also in the continent, Africa continent itself, and also have an institution, actually an organic farming training institution, whereby we are able to have many, many students youth being trained on the same so that adoption can be continuous throughout. So this also can be achieved through the foreign uh, partnership abroad. If you feel you could work with South Africa or Simon, or would like to reach out to him, you can do so via their Facebook page, which there is a link to in the show notes. Alternatively, please email podcast at rootsandall.co.uk and I can put you in touch. I'd like to say thank you to Simon for taking the time to talk to us about his work, and also for the work he's doing to promote organic farming and to promote the economic and physical welfare of farmers in Kenya. I'd also like to say thank you to two of the Roots and All patrons, Ronnie and Dave, for suggesting two of the questions that I put to Simon, both of which prompted an enthusiastic response from him. I really am grateful to the Patreon supporters and those of you who've donated on GoFundMe. I pay extra for my monthly phone contract, so I get 100 international minutes a month, which allows me to interview guests overseas. And sadly, I didn't realise that Kenya wasn't included in the international call package. And the call to Simon ended up costing me over 100 quid. So I'm really grateful to all of you for providing me with a bit of financial safety uh, when it comes to the routine expenses and also to the unexpected ones, which are a result of me being a Wally. A huge thanks to you for listening. and I will catch you all next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.